Hello, folks. All right. Well, this time I want to get into talking about test automation. So, again, we've talked earlier about the idea that we would really like the ability to automatically run a set of tests on our code. So that basically when we're ready with a new version of our program, we push a button and it goes through and takes care of everything for us and just gives us a summary. You know, it passed everything or it failed this test, this test, and this test. So we could have pretty large collections of test cases. So having this kind of automation is a really important thing, right? Again, as we mentioned before, manual testing, it's slow, it's error prone, right? We, there's just so many disadvantages to doing this sort of thing manually that we would really like to automate it if possible. Now, <clears throat> now if possible, it would be ideal if we could pick sets of tests and say, okay, run this particular set of tests because this is the part that we're really interested in right now. You now, obviously, we want to do a full round of testing before we confirm anything that we're going to ship off. But when I'm going through and working on a particular part of the program, I might want to focus more on, okay, let's, let's rerun the, the relevant part of tests right away. So ideally, we would like to be able to pick different sets of tests, make sure that it you know, run the set of tests for it to see if it works on Windows. Run the set of tests to see if it works on my phone. Run the set of tests to see if the error checking for bad files. Well, yeah, th this sort of idea of having different sets of tests and we're allowed to say, okay, these are the ones I want to run right now. There is an even further um, approach to this, the idea of continuous testing, where the process is entirely automated so that as soon as we do a commit, for instance, it grabs that committed code and automatically goes through and starts running testing on it and does doing the reporting on it. And actually, there's pipelining approaches where you have this notion that as soon as you do a commit, it goes through and does the test. And if it passes the testing, then it can be automatically integrated into the, um, the, next, develop, or the next production environment, for instance. So you can have some very sophisticated pipeline processes associated with this. Now, we're not going to get that ambitious. Um, we're going to focus on just coming up with a couple of simple bash scripts that will allow us to do some automated testing on uh, programs that we create, for instance, for the labs or the project. Now, in terms of the test data that we're going to work with, right? every single test case we run is going to have a bunch of information associated with it. Right? We might have a name for the test case and a description of it, right? What, what's this supposed to be testing? What part of the program is it testing? So it might be a simple unit test for one individual piece deep inside there, or it might be one particular, you know, our project might consist of multiple programs, for instance, or multiple scripts. It might be testing one of those. There might be input files that the test involves, right? If the program reads from different inputs, then we might have input files to use. There might be user input that is expected to be a part of that test case. So that has to be that has to exist somewhere so that it can be piped into the program. There might be command line arguments that need to be passed to the, the script or the program or parameters that need to be passed to the function that's being tested. There might be output that you're expecting from it. So there might be some that goes to standard output, some that goes to standard error. There might be updates that it does to files. It might create some files. It might modify some files. It might move or delete or rename some files. All right, so there might be all sorts of side effects that, that are expected from the behavior. And it might change permission settings on a directory or something. Who knows? And of course, there might also be the, whatever return value you get from this, whatever exit status you get from it. And so our testing tool is going to have to be able to work with all of these, apply them all appropriately, and evaluate the, the results. So there can be a lot involved in running your different test cases. And you think about a, um, a program that's supposed to modify a file, then our test cases are going to involve things like, well, you know, what if the file doesn't exist? What if it's an absolute path? What's if it, what if it's a relative path? What if it's locked? Um, what if the write to the file fails in the end because we're out of disk space or some such thing? All sorts of different cases that might be involved here, aside from the actual data handling aspect of it. So there's a lot to think about in terms of the test data components that our automation tool is going to have to work with. 
And ideally, again, we'd like our test tool or our test script to be configurable so that we can specify, well, here's where to find all these different pieces of information, and here's which ones I want to use right now. So for each of the test cases, our tool or our script should go through and grab all those pieces of information from wherever we've configured it to look. It should run the test case on all the different pieces there right, with the command line arguments that were given and with the user input that was provided as part of the, the test data and with the files that it gave. Right? It should capture all of the output, all of the side effects, the return value or exit status, and it should compare those results to what was expected. And it should generate some form of report or some form of summary. It might just be a simple pass fail or it might be more detailed information that it gives. And again, that information should go someplace predictable, maybe someplace configurable. So again, there's a lot going on in an automated test script. Now, there's a ton of different test tools out there um, in all sorts of languages, at all sorts of price points, and with all sorts of features. So you can, by all means, start looking at automated testing tools. We'll take a look at writing our own just so we can see what's involved in this process. And again, we're just going to use bash scripts and we'll keep it pretty simple, but it gives you a good idea of some of the things that have to be considered. And it gives you an idea of what's going on with some of these testing tools when you are using them. All right, again, when it comes to our test sets, Ideally, I want to make it as easy as possible for the tester to change a test case, right? It might be the case that we actually get it wrong or we want to add something to it, to add new test cases, to remove old ones, and to specify which sets of test cases to run. So we want this to be easily configurable, right? We want this to be simple for the tester to use, to add new test cases, to change test cases, to see the results. So one of the ideas is we'll say, okay, well, we'll put each set of test cases in a directory someplace. And when we want to run that set of test cases, we'll just tell the script, okay, run the test cases in directory blah. And that way we can have a whole bunch of different directories with different sets of cases. And maybe we say, okay, go run the, the sets of tests in this directory, that directory, and the other directory, right? And it goes through and takes care of all of them for us. Now, to do that kind of thing, we have to think about, okay, well, what does the structure of the directories have to look like? Where does all the different pieces of test data go, right? Where should it look to find the input data? Where should it look to find the command line arguments? Where should it look to find the um, expected output? All of that kind of thing has to be decided when we're designing our tool, when we're designing our script. So simple example. Suppose we've got a program, it's going to take a file name as a command line argument, it's going to get some input data from the user, it's going to write results to that file, and it's going to exit with a zero if it's okay and a one if it fails. So what you might do is go through and say, okay, well, let's have a test case file for each test case that's going to have a line with the name and description of the test case. Then it's going to have, maybe on the next line down, it'll have a file name, and that file will contain the command line arguments to use. Uh, maybe it's got another one for the user input data, the expected in or exit status, right? The expected file content, right? So it's going to so our then our script can be designed or our testing tool can be designed to go through and say, okay, well, when I'm reading that test case file, I'll read the the name or the description and just use that for my reporting information. I'll read the file name to go grab the command line arguments. I might grab a file name to go grab the user input, uh, grab the expected exit status. Again, that might be from our test case file. And then I'll go through and run the test and compare it to the contents of the expected file content afterwards. So it's not difficult to think through the process that we want it to follow. And as long as we build up our test tool or test script incrementally, we can manage to implement all this stuff fairly effectively. So we go through, we create a bunch of different directories, each one with a different set of test case files, right? With And each test case file has its description of what uh, what's supposed to happen for that test case, how to run it. We run our test script, we tell it which directories we want it to use, 
It runs every test case from every one of the directories. And maybe for each one, it prints the name of the test case, pass or fail. And at the very end, it generates a summary. It keeps a count as it goes of how many it passed and how many it failed. And we can look at the output to see which ones it failed. All right, so it's a relatively straightforward process to describe. It's not going to be an insanely complicated script, but it does give us a way to automate what we want and, again, to save our testers the nightmare of having to do all this stuff manually. All right, so what we'll start looking at is the idea of actually implementing such a script. We'll get into that in the next couple of sessions.